First Days Amongst the Contrabands by Elizabeth Hyde Botoom Read by Frank Blissett Chapter 4 Within the Lines Continued First School Days One bright November morning I started to take possession of my contraband school. The air was soft as June, birds were singing, the cotton fields were gay with blossoms which contrasted charmingly with the white matured bowls. My path lay through a grand old live oak grove. It was wonderfully attractive, with its great trees covered with long gray moss, through which the broad sunshine cast fantastic lights and shadows. From this I emerged into an open field. There was no regular path, and the walk over the old cotton hills was exceedingly rough and uncomfortable. The schoolhouse to which I was appointed was a rough wooden building standing on palmetto posts two or three feet from the ground, with an open piazza on one side. When I first came in sight of this building, the piazza was crowded with children, all screaming and chattering like a flock of jays and blackbirds in a quarrel but as soon as they saw me, they all gave a whoop and a bound and disappeared. When I reached the door, there was no living thing to be seen. All was literally as still as a mouse. So I inspected my new quarters while waiting for my forces. There was one good-sized room without partitions. It was not sealed, but besides the usual heavy board shutters, its six windows were glazed. This was a luxury which belonged to but few of the school buildings. Indeed, these glazed windows had been held up to me as a marked feature in my new location. The furniture consisted of a few wooden benches, a tall pine desk with a high office stool, one narrow blackboard leaning against a post, and a huge box stove large enough to warm a Puritan meeting's house in the olden times. The pipe of the stove was put through one window. I sketched the picture of this, my first schoolroom, with tenderness. Rude and uncouth as it was, there are others besides myself who hold this place as sacred. I believe this was the first building ever erected exclusively for a colored school. It was built for the colored refugees with a fund sent to General Saxton for this purpose by a Ladies' Freedmen's Aid Society in England. All the contraband schools were at that time kept in churches or cotton barns or old kitchens. Some teachers had their classes in tents. Inspection over, I vigorously rang a little cracked handbell which I found on the desk. Then I saw several pairs of bright eyes peering in at the open door. But going towards them, there was a general scampering, and I could only see a head or a foot disappearing under the house. Again I rang the bell with the same result until I began to despair of getting my scholars together. When I turned my back, they all came out. When I faced about, they darted off. In time, however, I succeeded in capturing one small urchin, who howled vociferously, O oh Lord! O oh Lord! This brought out the others, who seemed a little scared and much amused. I soon reassured my captive, so the rest came in. 
Then I tried to seat them, which was about as easy as keeping so many marbles in place on a smooth floor. Going towards half a dozen little fellows huddled together on one bench, they simultaneously darted down under the seat and scampered off on their hands and feet to a corner of the room, looking very much like a family of frightened kittens. Hearing a noise and suppressed titters back of me, I looked around and saw four or five larger boys rolling over and over under the benches towards the door. Whether for fun or freedom I could not tell, but as the first boy sprang to his feet and out of the door, I concluded they all planned escape. But I halted the rest, and got them on to their feet and into their seats. Then I looked them over. They saw I was not angry, but in earnest, so they quieted down. The runaway peeped in at the door, then crept along and sat down by his companions. There was not a crowd of them, not half as many as I supposed from all the clatter they had made. All these children were black as ink and as shy as wild animals. I had seen some of them before, and the brightest among them had been pointed out, but they all looked alike to me now. I tried in vain to fix upon some distinguishing mark by which I might know one from another. Some of these children had been in a school before, but they were afraid of white people, and especially of strangers. As they said of a teacher on a subsequent occasion, A saint no she. I had much the same experience with these children a few months later. Smallpox had broken out in the colored camps around Beaufort, and the commanding officer issued an order that all the children should be vaccinated. So one morning a physician came to my school for this purpose. I expected him, but had said nothing, not anticipating a riot. The room was full, many large boys and girls being present. The doctor laid his hat with a small box on the desk and took a chair. I called the largest girl in the room to me, and I rolled up her sleeve, the whole school watching us with anxiety. The doctor took hold of her hand and raised his lancet. This was too much. She uttered a shriek, exclaiming, Oh, Jesus, save me! and, snatching away her hand, she darted out of the room, and the entire school followed her. The leaders dashed down the river bank, and the little ones darted under the house. I called in vain, and frantically rang my bell. Miss Fanny, who was with me by that time, hunted about and coaxed the few laggards she found, but they were not to be lured back to face a direful enemy who confronted them with a murderous weapon. There was nothing further to be done that day. The doctor went home, and towards night Miss Fanny and I went to see some of the people, to whom we explained the object of the doctor's visit. The mothers, who had been watchful to protect their children, now turned around and berated them well for being so scary. Don't you fret, missus, they is sure to be there tomorrow, they said, and so they were, in full force. The doctor came again, and I explained what he wished to do, bearing my own arm to show them the scar made by vaccination in my childhood. Now they were all as eager to have this done as they were reluctant before. Some of the boys came back and begged to have 
some of that little stuff put into the other arm. They evidently considered the bit of court plaster a badge of honor. These children had been born and bred in troublous times. They had always been surrounded by conflict and confusion. Irrepressible? That's tame. They were in a constant state of effervescence. In time, after some more skirmishing, the little gang before me was brought into a degree of order. They listened, apparently, with open mouths and staring eyes to what I had to say. But I soon discovered my words were like an unknown tongue to them. I must first know something of their dialect in order that we might understand each other. Now I wished to take down the names of these children, so I turned to the girl nearest me and said, What is your name? It is Phyllis, ma'am. But what is your other name? Only Phyllis, ma'am. I then explained that we all have two names, but she still replied, Nothing but Phyllis, ma'am. Upon this, an older girl started up and exclaimed, Pshaw, gal, what's you um title? Whereupon she gave the name of her old master. After this, each child gave two names, most of them funny combinations. Sometimes they would tell me one thing, and when asked to repeat it, would say something quite different. The older children would frequently correct and contradict the younger ones. I know now that they manifested much ingenuity in invention or selection of names and titles. One boy gave his name as Middleton Haywood, shouting it out as if it were something he had caught and might lose. Whereupon another boy started up, saying angrily, not so, boy. You ain't Massa Middy's boy. I is. All were busily studying up their cargo men's, and two or three would try to speak together before being called upon. One boy was Pumpkin, another Squash, and another Cornhouse. The girls were Honey and Baby and Missy and Tay, with an indiscriminate adoption of Rets, Barnwells, Elliots, Stuarts, and Middletons for titles. I thought of Adams naming the animals, and wondered if he had been as much puzzled as I. Certainly he gave out the names at first hand, and had no conflicting incongruities to puzzle him. In time I enrolled fifteen names, the number present. The next morning I called the roll, but no one answered, so I was obliged to go around again and make out a new list. I could not distinguish one from another. They looked like so many peas in a pod. The woolly heads of the girls and boys looked just alike. All wore indiscriminately any cast-off garments given them, so it was not easy to tell which was which. Were there twenty-five new scholars, or only ten? The third morning it was the same work over again. There were forty children present, many of them large boys and girls. I had already a list of over forty names. Amongst these were most of the months of the year and days of the week, besides a number of Pompeys, Cudjos, Sambos, and Renas and Rosas and Floras. I now wrote down forty new names, and I began to despair of ever getting regulated. Fortunately, the day before, 
I had given out two dozen paper primers with colored pictures and had written a name on each. So I called these names, but only two or three children came forward to claim their books. So I laid the rest one side. Then half a dozen little heads were lifted up, and one boy said, Please, ma'am, us wants one of dem. I have no more, and these are given away already, I said. You na done give dem to we, they exclaimed. I asked the first boy what was his name. Then I looked over the books. No name had been put down like the one he gave. It was the same with all the rest. But as I turned the books over, one girl exclaimed, Dar, da him! And coming forward, she pointed to one of the primers with evident delight, saying, Him's mine. I looked at the written name. It was Lucy Barnwell. I asked her name. It was Fanny Osborne. Pshaw, gal, exclaimed an older girl. That's Una Mammy's name. Now the others came forward and picked out their own books. What marks they had to distinguish their property, I have never been able to discover. But the children, and the older people too, rarely ever make mistakes in these ways. I have taken up a pile of books all just alike, and called to the children sitting in their seats to tell me to whom they belonged. They not only knew their own property, but their neighbors also. In time I began to get acquainted with some of their faces. I could remember that Corn House yesterday was Primus today, that Quash was Brian. He was already denying the old sobriquet and threatening to mash your mouth in to anyone who called him Quash. I reproved the boys for teasing him. Oh, us just call him so, with a little chuckle, as if he ought to see the fun. The older people told me that these were basket names. Nemsays, namesakes, gives folks different names. It was months before I learned their family relations. The terms bubber for brother and titty for sister with Nana for mother, and mother for grandmother, and father for all leaders in church and society, were so generally used, I was forced to believe that all belonged to one immense family. It was hopeless trying to understand their titles. There were two half-brothers in school. One was called Dick, and the other Richard. In one family there were nine brothers and half-brothers, and each took a different title. One took Hamilton, and another Singleton, and another Baker, and others Smith, Simmons, etc. Their father was Jimmy of the Battery, or Jimmy Black. I asked why his title was Black. Oh, him look so, him one very black man, they said. These men are well settled and have families growing up in honor and respectability who are as tenacious of their titles as any of the FFVs. One boy gave the name of Middleton, but afterwards came to me wishing to have it changed saying, That's my old rebel master's title. Him's nothing to me now. I don't belong to him no longer, and I don't see no use in being called for him. But when I asked what other name he would choose, the poor fellow was much puzzled. 
He evidently supposed I could supply a proper cognomen as I supplied new clothes, picking out something to fit. In time he decided upon Drayton, as that was a good name in secesh times, and General Drayton was a friend to we, and no mistake. He fight on our side against his own brother when the first gun shoot. That was the beginning of time for these poor freed people, when the first gun shoot. Refugee Quarters On Thursday the schoolroom was filled with eager children who truly might be called a jolly crowd. Only a few of these knew their letters. Those who had been in a school in the spring were shy of a new teacher. They must first see how things were going on. For us ain't no she, was their repeated assertion. Caution was their predominant quality. None of the children could count beyond twenty, so there was ample opportunity for oral instruction. I tried to group them in families. Twice a day I called the roll, that we might all become familiar with the new condition of things. It was difficult to tell at roll call which was more puzzled, teacher or scholars. Friday, alas, found a terrible falling off. Not a quarter of the usual number were present. To my inquiries as to the cause for this, the invariable reply was, Him home for wash. This showed me that Friday was the universal washing day throughout the colony. Thinking the work might be performed in half a day, I dismissed the little ones present and told them to run home and tell all the others to come, for I was waiting for them. That was the last of school for that day. I waited and watched two hours in vain. No one came. So I shut my door and went to hunt for my scholars in the refugee quarters. These quarters were about half a mile away. There was a row of a dozen or more buildings, which resembled huge wooden boxes. Each house was divided into four rooms or compartments, and in each room was located one family of from five to fifteen persons. In each room was a large fireplace, an opening for a window with a broad board shutter, and a double row of berths built against the wall for beds. One or more low benches and a pine table with piggins, homemade cedar tubs, on it completed the furniture. The whiteness and cleanliness of table and piggins, and occasionally a gourd or tin dipper, to which may be added the number and variety of articles of wearing apparel hanging on a cross-piece in front of the bunks, indicated the character, I might say the social status, of the owner. This village was built by the quartermaster of General Saxton's department, for the refugees brought off by General Montgomery's raid up the Cumbee and Ashapoo rivers in May and June 1863. In his first expedition he brought off three hundred of these poor slaves who came to him for refuge, and seven hundred and twenty-seven on the second. I now came for the first time face to face with life in the one-roomed cabin. Outwardly it represented the poorest and most meager animal existence. Was I repelled by these conditions? On the contrary, my whole heart went out in pity for them. 
I forgot that I was working alone and single-handed, and I was ready to help them at any sacrifice. In military order, I began inspection at once to marshal my forces and muster in recruits. In spite of most adverse circumstances, there was a general air of tidiness and decency around the place. The space before some of the doorways was swept clean and sprinkled with white sand from the bluff. Some clothes, just washed, were spread over the wild plum bushes, and the wash tubs were turned on their sides against the house. These tubs were old beer barrels sawed in two. All of the houses were not so respectable, but I soon learned the people had chosen a leader from their own gang to act as supervisor. To them he was something like the driver on the old plantations. Most of the women were sitting out of doors. The younger ones said their husbands were Mung Montgomery's men, ma'am, meaning Montgomery's Regiment C.J., which was at that time in Florida. One woman was dexterously spinning cotton thread on a wooden spindle, or a long wooden pin, one end of which rested in a tin basin in her lap. With her right hand she twirled the spindle, holding small bits of cotton, roughly fashioned into rolls, with her left. In this rude manner she made most respectable thread and yarn, which she used for sewing and for knitting. She was shy at first about showing her work, or answering my questions, and she received my praise of her skill with evident distrust. Later I learned that the colored people were prohibited by law from appropriating even a single bowl of cotton to their own use. But it was a very common thing for each woman to secrete a few handfuls of the cotton she had picked when she left the field. The old habit of helping themselves to a fraction of the products of their labor, which they could not get otherwise, still clung to them. They evidently did not understand why they were not entitled to a pound of the cotton they alone had worked, when strange white people were seizing and carrying off whole crops on which they had no apparent claim the crops which the slaves had raised for their masters, and which had been kept in their hands. These people called themselves Cumbies because they came from Cumbie River. The Cumbie women knew how to do many things of which the island people were quite ignorant. Before spring I saw many pairs of shapely gloves and stout stockings made of the coarse yarn spun in a tin basin and knitted on reeds cut in the swamps. These were sent to husbands, sons, and lovers, off on duty as soldiers. It was a long time before I learned that the crude material used was contraband. When the women found me so unsuspicious, they exhibited their handicraft with no small degree of pride. It was not an unusual thing to meet a woman coming from the field where she had been hoeing cotton, with a small bucket or cup on her head and a hoe over her shoulder, contentedly smoking a pipe and briskly knitting as she strode along. I have seen, added to all these, a baby strapped to her back. The patient devotion of these negro women was most admirable. Two of the best people I have known were a man and his wife, superior field hands, who always headed the gang of workers. He had charge of a mule and rode to and from the field, 
whilst his wife patiently walked behind, carrying the hose and other tools. Whenever she rode with him in the mule cart, she sat behind with her back to him. I will say here that this man came on and up in the world until he bought land for himself and built a house with two stories and owned a good horse and buggy with which he drove to town, his wife proudly sitting by his side. One of the most respectable of the old woman constituted herself my guide as I made the rounds of the refugee quarters. At one door was old Leah, trying to darn a soldier's threadbare coat with some of the coarse yarn she had spun herself. The coat was black and the thread white, but that made no difference. On the contrary, I think she liked it better so. It looked like coarse embroidery to her. I praised her work. Oh, missus, us all larn to do little things for we sells, she said with a laugh. I been cook for white folks steady. We's cumby, ma'am as if to be cumby implied everything. At another house my guide told me lived Sylvie and Joe and baby and two chillin dead. Hunger kill em last June. That was the time they fled from cumby. Susie said, Me and my old man lib here, and we sister lib wid we. Him got husband, but specs him husband in Beefort, ma'am. No one was willing to confess there were any young or able-bodied men around, for fear they would be drafted into the army. They were proud of volunteers, but a draft was like an ignominious seizure. These women were not quite sure of me, as I went around with notebook in hand. I might be a spy or a detective. It was a long time before these refugees could get rid of their suspicions of white people. Perhaps they never did. Since the beginning of the war, they had been time and again deceived by Northerners and Southerners. General Sherman tells the story of a Negro who cautiously approached his camp one night and watched him a long time before he would commit himself. Not long before, some rebel soldiers had put on the blue overcoats of the Unionists and talked with the Negroes, calling themselves their friends, and then severely punished them for manifesting sympathy with the Yankees. Sarah and her husband, November, greeted me cordially. Us has three children, missus, said Sarah. Dem must go to school, for us want to learn something, for sure. My guide took me into one room to see Viola, who was in bed desperately ill. She had no clothing or anything to make her comfortable. Her husband, said the woman, is with Montgomery's boys in the regiment. Now the mother-in-law rose, she pronounced it as one word, mother-in-law rose, tucks care of him. The devotion of this old mother-in-law I have rarely seen equaled. When the contrabands were first put in the barracks, there were twice as many as could possibly find room there. So government put up tents for the overflow. Viola was put in one of the tents, where she remained through the winter, which was unusually severe. Smallpox broke out amongst the refugees, and their wants and sufferings were indescribable. Poor Viola never recovered from this exposure. 
Old Rose gave up her room for her, and lived in the tent without fire or a floor. My heart ached for these poor creatures, and I promised to send them something to make them more comfortable as soon as I reached home. God bless you, na missus. Una can't do nothing, and Una mustn't fret for we. It can't be help it. Us don't complain, and us so glad to be here, said the brave old woman. I was so glad to turn from this sad scene to meet Tamar, a robust, merry looking, middle aged woman. Her mother and grandmother lived in the room with her. She also had three children, one of whom was married and lived there with his wife and baby, which baby the oldest woman was minding. It was something to see five generations together, all apparently in good condition. At my request, Ned, the young father, took the baby, and all stood in a row. In the old vernacular, they would have been called a prime lot of niggers. I never saw a more fearless and self contained set. They were all very black, and had been considered valuable, and they knew their own importance. Tamar said of her boys, Missus, they must go to school, sure. Us wants to larn, for we've been in darkness too long, and now we're in light. Us want to larn. I wants to go to school too, myself, if I kin larn. The great grandmother, old Affy, was said to be over one hundred years old. At one time we were speaking to her of her age, and a gentleman of our party said, Auntie, I shouldn't wonder if you are one hundred and fifty years old. I specs I is, Massa, or one hundred and sixty at least. Why deaf forget to tuck me long time ago? She answered with dejection. She always seemed aggravated and neglected to be left so long behind her comrades. I can't stay behind, my lord, I can't stay behind, is one of their spirituals. My guide stopped at one door, saying, A heap of folks lives here, missus. Sure enough. I wrote down these names as she called them off Venus, and John, and Aunt Dinah, and Gumbo, and Mingo, and Dido, and Galphilus, and Flora, and him grandson Billy, and Dal, and two children named Sadrach and Cudjo, all of one family or all masses niggers, which meant the same thing. They had fled from bondage together, and were now unwilling to be separated. My head grew dizzy trying to understand the dialect of these people. I was hopelessly confused in regard to their family relations, and I never knew whether they were talking of boys or girls. They spoke of all as him. One woman said her husband was drove up the country by de rebels and us brought off and never see him no more. She lived with her sister, whose husband was gone for soldier. Their children had all died. And you see, missus, us all alone, and us hab sup sorrow, I can tell yer. But tank de Lord, us ain't without hope, said one. I stopped before one door in which stood two very bright looking women, 
Jane and Daphne, who welcomed me with smiles and courtesies, and asked me to take a seat. This I gladly did, for their room was as clean as possible, with an air of comfort, in spite of its poor condition. The rough floor had been scoured until it had become smooth, and over it was spread fresh white sand. On one side of the room were two rude shelves, on which were rows of piggins and pans and some iron spoons, all as bright as soap and sand could make them. The woman's dresses were nothing but patches, sewed together with every variety of thread, even to coarse twine, but perfectly nice and clean. I asked Jane, the older woman, if she had a husband. She gave a cheery laugh and tossed her head, saying, I specs I is, ma'am, somewhere amongst the secesh. But I don't know where, and I ain't seen him. I don't know when's the time. Then she added, with a pardonable degree of pride, that she had a son in 33rd Regiment, Sergeant Jones of Company G Street. She always added street to the company, as if to give it greater importance. She told me of a daughter who was left behind with the rebels, and whom she had not seen for a long time. Talking of this daughter, the child of her heart, her face became sad and wistful. For God only knows whether I'll ever see her again. She is shut up somewhere in Charleston. This little quaint old woman attracted me greatly by her brightness and her ready intelligence. She soon after came to live with me as cook, and was under my care the rest of her days. She proved a wonderful servant and a most valued friend. She belonged to a good class. All her people had been house servants, and no one of them had ever been bought or sold. This was to her the very acme of respectability. Sometimes she expressed great contempt for what she termed country niggers. Daphne told me her husband was in Montgomery's battles. She and Jane were the first people I had met who were willing to talk of their old master. They had belonged to one of the oldest and most honored families in Charleston, and they always spoke with respect and affection of their former owners. Him fret on to death when us come off, said Daphne. Before I had gone far, I discovered that as I had begun to make calls, I must not omit one house, nor fail to speak to a single person, from the oldest grandparent to the youngest child. Their social rights were inexorable. My guide said, All of them people wait to say, How dia, to you. So I went on. The children soon made out my errand, and decided I came as a friend, so they swarmed around me like flies. I sat down on a hen-coop, and proceeded to write down their names, whilst my guide called out to them to scrape the foot and have manners. These were the names they gave, Sambo, Silva, March, April, Cornhouse, Quash, Juno, Another April, Phoebe, Flora, Rose, Missy, Gurley, Tant, June, November, Friday, Monday, Gumbo, and Jack. Not one gave any title, nor knew what I meant when I asked for one. 
The first boy I captured and succeeded in making stand long enough to tell his name was nearly scared out of his wits. He could only ejaculate, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, as if his death warrant had been signed. But when the others found this was a harmless process, they were only too eager to be enrolled. Some of them came up twice and wished to assume a second name. Before I came to the end of the line, the last ones grew uneasy, for fear they should not be taken in, and began to say, You ain't call me, nor me, nor me. At the last, as I was closing my book, there came hurriedly forward, Myla and he ante and some others, begging to be ticketed too. As I read over the long list, I felt sure of a full school, but was much in doubt whether I had seen any of these before, or if they were fresh recruits. The most notable people there were Smart and Mary Washington. They became staunch allies in and out of school, and proved themselves worthy of their significant and illustrious names. The old man said he was a cooper by trade, for he was born and raised on a rice plantation, and he had seen hard times in his day. But de white folks tink much ob Mary, and ben kin to de old woman, for her ben a great breeder. That's so. Some dem woman breed like fish, said an old woman who stood near. So de massa ben very careful ob him, continued Smart. Later in the winter the old man brought his new Bible we had just given him for me to write his family record. He manifested a proper degree of pride when he announced himself as the father of nineteen sons. He was much puzzled, however, to give their names, as they had been called sometimes one thing and sometimes another. So many people give them basket names, I ain't exactly know myself which the right one, said the old man apologetically. But, after thinking a minute, he gave his head a wise little nod and started off so briskly, saying, Now I member. I felt quite sure he gave his boys new names throughout, substituting Moses for January and Benjamin for Hasty, etc. He confessed they had been known in Old Secesh times as Primus, Rooster, Mealbag, and other comical appellations which referred to some special time, place, or circumstance. After getting them in order and written down to his entire satisfaction, I asked where was this army of boys. To my surprise he answered gravely, In heaven, all sept one, and dat I tink is Solomon. Yes, I most sure he named Solomon. He is in Montgomery Regiment, for him's a big man, so tall I could eat off his head, meaning he was his own height. I asked if he had been married more than once. He hesitated, then said gravely, No, ma'am, only tween we and God. I was sure of a full attendance at school after these introductions. When I first came in sight of the house, the piazza was filled with men, women, and children. I had heard many exclamations of, Dar, da him! Mrs. comes for larn we! Dar, him come for sure! And there was a general shuffling of feet and happy greetings. 
Some of the children were disposed to dart off as usual, but the older ones kept them in order. The men and women had only come to get their names put down, as the field work was not done. Each one regarded it as an honor to be enrolled as a scholar. They all left with a new consciousness of their own individuality and personal dignity. I use this term advisedly. The poorest and most downtrodden of these people are self respecting. That was Chapter Four. Within the Lines Continued From First Days Amongst the Contrabands by Elizabeth Hyde Botum Read by Frank Blissett